Welcome to One Mind Zen Hermitage. So today, um, <clears throat> I'll be talking about utility. The utility of the things that we do in Zen. And I'll link that to our rituals. I'm on for about 15 minutes, so we won't get too deep. But if I were to walk through a day in the life of a Zen priest, we go to the Zendo, we take our shoes off. And taking our shoes off could be considered a ceremony or a ritual. If I ask you, how do you take your shoes off? And what do you do? You probably have a space you like to put your shoes away. You like to keep them. Some orderly process about taking your shoes off. That takes you one step from where you were before to where you are now. After you take your shoes off, maybe you face the Buddha and bow, proceed to your Zafu, face the Zafu and bow. Each of these is a ritual or a ceremony, separating you yet farther from where you were before you entered the door. Now, the reason that's important is because our mind doesn't necessarily discriminate in terms of how long a ritual or ceremony is. It's simply the changing of the channel. I was outside driving and someone was cutting me off or the lights weren't behaving appropriately or someone did this or I felt that or I was distracted by this song or whatever the activity of life outside the Zendo door, as you enter the Zendo, there's ceremonies, rituals that have simple utility. I'm not saying that there aren't other reasons to do these things. It's very utilitarian to leave your shoes at the door and not track dirt into the Zendo that someone else has to clean up. Certainly, I'm not saying that there aren't special reasons that we face the Buddha and bow. What I am saying is we put a block between where you were before and where you are now. And as you go through your processes, your rituals and ceremonies, they separate you farther and farther from the day-to-day -day distractions and delusions and provide you the opportunity so that when the bell rings and you're sitting, you have an opportunity to explore your sensorium, the experience that's unfolding right now in a way that is your very own laboratory. As you breathe and you pay attention to your breathing, perhaps you can notice the senses of your breathing, how deep you're breathing, how fast or slow you're breathing, what it feels like as you breathe. All of these things are part of this experience that you're having right now. And those experiences are part of a way to come to an understanding of the way things are. We explore our mind and what unfolds and what comes up and feelings and sensations. And we do that by observing and noticing sometimes we're taken away by them. And suddenly we're trying to figure out how to fix a carburetor or what to do about a, um, a creaky door or what we'll wear to the meeting tomorrow or what should I get Aunt Sally for her birthday? Whatever it is, sometimes we get entangled with it and we follow it for a while. But in our meditations, we have the opportunity to say, you know, that's kind of important, but I'm sitting right now and the importance of it will mean 
seen that it'll come back and I, I won't forget. I'm just gonna put that down for now because I'm just observing. And as we do these observations and follow these sort of ritualistic patterns of behavior, we learn that feelings arise, emotions arise, sensations arise, they sustain for a while, maintain their condition, and slowly they taper off and um, fade. And in coming to a conclusion that that is the nature of things, is that things arise, they're conditioned, they arise, they remain for a while, and then they subside, we come to understand that our life in and of itself arises. The things in our lives that um, engage our moments arise, sustain, and eventually subside. So we're not necessarily locked to them as if they were fact, because they aren't immutable fact. They're a perception, a paradigm, an experience that passes. So we don't necessarily need to respond reflexively. We hit our knee with a one of those little rubber doctor hammers and our knee pops up. We might not have cho a choice over that. But our mental responses, we do. And these pieces of separation, these little ceremonies that we have, these rituals, separate ourselves from the re reflexive world. And the laboratory that we have here gives us the opportunity to notice that that is the nature of things and that we have a choice to observe that we have the elbow room to take a breath and choose not to be reflexive and reactive, but to choose a path based on our observation. There's a kind of freedom in that. Knowing that that chemical induced reaction that happens in our brain that causes us to feel tension or um, frustration or anger or even great joy um, arises, sustains for a while, and subsides. And we have a choice of how to engage with it. We can observe it and pick a path. We can observe it and determine that no, we're going to ride this delusion out and embrace it and notice that at some point in our meditation, oh, I was supposed to be paying attention to my breathing here, <laughs> whatever the case may be. Life is like that. We will come engage with others who are suffering and we get to choose if we are going to engage with them in a way that respects the fact that they are encumbered with suffering and sit with them while they suffer or if we are going to not engage with them at this time and allow them to sort their suffering nature for themselves it's not one or the other one is better or the other is better it's where are we going to engage in this situation is it going to be helpful for us to sit with them, perhaps to weep with them because they need someone to be with them and that's something we can do? Or is it just too much for us from where we are and we'll help them another time in a different way? We have the choice. I see a lot of folks who believe that the separation that can happen from this reflexive world is somehow right and that we shouldn't be emotive and engaged. But I'm of the opinion that because we can be emotive and engaged and because we know how to observe, we can choose to disengage when it's appropriate. So we can get involved in their mourning process and 
when it's time for us to leave, we can disengage with that and go on to our next um, experience without having a lot of unnecessary extra suffering because we did what needed to be done. We sat with them. We gave them um, emotional sustenance and support. Maybe we had dinner with them. Whatever the case may be, we engaged with them. And because of that, their suffering was reduced because they felt appreciated. They felt recognized. And it was important for both of us to experience that moment. Then we can walk into the Zendo and take our shoes off, and separate ourselves. We can bow to our Zafu and separate ourselves. We can bow to the Buddha and separate ourselves. Using our ritual, we can disconnect from those things that would otherwise continue to cause us suffering and distraction. 